Now this is the third part of our antibiotics and resistance mechanisms lecture. And in this lecture, we're going to focus on the mechanisms of antibiotic or antimicrobial agent, to be more correct, resistance. So bacteria have developed a number of mechanisms that allow them to resist being killed by antimicrobial agents. So some of these mechanisms include enzyme production. We already talked about penicillinase and beta-lactamase, which are enzymes that many bacteria can produce. So in general, bacteria will produce enzymes that can detoxify or inactivate the antimicrobial agent. Bacteria can alter, also alter their target sites to reduce or block the antimicrobial agent from being able to bind. So if they produce a slightly altered ribosomal subunit that still functions for translation of messenger RNA, but where those drugs that bind to it can no longer bind, that is a, a very clever mechanism. Some bacteria prevent transport of the agent into the bacterium. So they might alter their cytoplasmic membrane a bit, and then the antimicrobial agent can't get into the cell. Some bacteria will develop alternate metabolic pathways. So if an antimicrobial agent targets a specific metabolic pathway, for example, the folate synthesis pathway, if it's altered slightly, then those types of antimicrobial agents that use that pathway won't be effective. Some bacteria can increase the production of certain enzymes. So there's so many mechanisms that bacteria can use to resist being killed by antimicrobial agents. The different types of resistance include intrinsic and acquired. So intrinsic resistance is an inherent or natural genotype within that micro, microorganism. So we talked about some microorganisms. For example, Bacteroides, gram-negative anaerobic bacillus. That organism is intrinsically resistant to many, many different types of antimicrobial agents. Um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis is intrinsically resistant to many types of our typical antimicrobial agents because they have that thick, waxy cell wall. Um, Burkholderia is naturally or intrinsically highly resistant to antimicrobial agents. Now, there are other bacteria that will acquire resistance. They're not intrinsically or naturally resistant, but they will acquire something that allows them to be resistant. So they will acquire a mutation in their genomic DNA in a specific gene that will then allow them to resist a, a specific antimicrobial agent. For example, mycobacterium tuberculosis gets mutations in certain genes. There's a gene called INHA. If they get a specific mutation in that gene, they become resistant to isoniazid. Other bacteria will take in a plasmid. So remember, a plasmid is a self-replicating circular piece of DNA. Some bacteria can just randomly take in plasmids. And if they take in a plasmid that's carrying a resistance gene, they will then become resistant. So Enterococcus can take in plasmids and become resistant to antimicrobial agents from the plasmid. There's also something called transposons. These are called jumping genes. And these are little pieces of DNA that can jump around the chromosome and possibly put in a resistance gene. 
So we'll first talk about intrinsic resistance. Impermeability is one uh, method of intrinsic resistance. So antibiotics have to be able to penetrate the cell wall in order for them to function. So there are some organisms that are impermeable based on their lipopolysaccharide composition. Um, so for example, some antibiotics are only effective we saw for gram positive organisms and not for gram negative organisms and that's based on the lipopolysaccharide composition. Some bacteria will make what's called porins or these little channels that will get um, take nutrients into the cell and take waste out of the cell. So if you alter, if these bacteria are able to alter their porin structure, then there's a reduced affinity for the antimicrobial agent and so then that antimicrobial agent can't get into the cell. Biofilms are a great way for bacteria to be resistant to antimicrobial agents. So biofilms are communities of bacteria that form a matrix. They almost form a little wall. So biofilms commonly occur on artificial surfaces like plastics. They will occur in the hospital selling on a setting on indwelling medical devices such as catheters and when they get on these indwelling devices you will get a group of organisms that are incredibly resistant to antimicrobial agents. Eflux pumps. Some bacteria have eflux pumps. Kind of they're similar to a little sub pump. Some of you have sub pumps in your basement if you tend to get water in your basement, you'll, your sub pump will detect when the water level is getting too high and will automatically turn on and pump water out of the basement. So bacteria have a similar mechanism. Both gram positive and gram negative bacteria can have these efflux pumps where the antimicrobial agent will come in and they will pump it right back out. We already mentioned the beta-lactamase and penicillinase enzymes that bacteria, many bacteria can produce beta-lactamases and penicillinases. If you remember, we talked about the ESBLs, the extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing bacteria, commonly Klebsiella pneumoniae and a couple of the other Enterobacteriaceae gram-negative bacilli are ESBLs. They produce beta-lactamases, so you have to test for that because you either have to use a beta-lactamase inhibitor in conjunction with a beta-lactam anti antimicrobial agent or you have to use a very different type of antimicrobial agent. Now we'll talk about acquired resistance mechanisms. So again, efflux. Some bacteria naturally have efflux pumps. So they are intrinsically resistant to certain antimicrobial agents because they can pump them out. Other bacteria will acquire an efflux pump. They will acquire a gene that allows them to pump certain types of antimicrobial agents out of the cell. So an example of that is the MEF E gene in Streptococcus pneumoniae and the MEF A gene in Streptococcus pyogenes. Some t will target the, the will modify the target site. So if the bacteria can modify the target site that the antimicrobial agent uses, then the antimicrobial agent won't be able to recognize or bind to that target site. Usually this happens through acquired chromosomal mutations in the bacterial genome. 
acquiring new targets or the ability to produce an enzyme when they didn't previously have that ability. So some bacteria will acquire a target that has a reduced affinity for an antibiotic, so that antimicrobial agent will no longer be able to bind to that target. Um, they might acquire a gene that allows them pr to produce beta-lactamase or penicillinase or another enzyme. And here's a schematic of the various types of resistance mechanisms that bacteria have acquired over the years that allow them to resist antimicrobial agents. Some of these are intrinsic. The bacteria have them and have always had them and allow them to resist certain types of antimicrobial agents. And some of them acquire these res the resistance abilities. Now, dissemination of resistance. We already mentioned plasmids, that extra chromosomal circular self-replicating piece of DNA that some bacteria can take in and acquire them. Transposons, again, we already mentioned those little pieces of DNA that can excise from one area of the genome and jump into another area. There are insertion sequences. So these little insertion sequences can get inserted into the genome of the bacteria and possibly these sequences give them a resistance mechanism, the ability to produce an enzyme, for example. Integrins are other genetic elements that will integrate resistance genes into the genome. So here's an example. You have in a bacterial cell that is carrying a plasmid that has a antimicrobial resistance gene on it. That cell is inside the body and it's resistant to a certain antimicrobial agent. Right next to that cell is another bacterium that doesn't have a plasmid. That bacterium is sensitive. So if it's exposed to that antimicrobial agent, the sensitive bacterium will get killed. Well, through conjugation, or that F. pilis, we talked about this way back, I believe, in the first week, where two organisms can conjugate and pass um, DNA from one to the other. So through conjugation or the F. pilis, one bacteria, the resistant bacteria, will transfer its plasmid, will make a copy of the plasmid first, doesn't want to lose its plasmid, but it'll make a copy of it and transfer a copy of the plasmid to the sensitive cell. Well now all of a sudden both of those cells become resistant to that antimicrobial agent. And these bacterial cells can take in multiple plasmids and each plasmid might have a different resistance gene on it and then all of a sudden that agent, that uh, cell, bacterial cell, becomes resistant to multiple antimicrobial agents. So we have gotten a lot smarter about antibiotics. Most physicians aren't just handing out antibiotics when you call them up on the phone and tell them you have a sniffle. Usually they want to see that you actually have a bacterial infection. Since 75% of the infections that we get, routine infections, are viral. It's common cold, rhinoviruses, enteroviruses, intestinal viruses. So we shouldn't be taking antibiotics for most of these things. We should let our immune system come in and fight off the infection. Now, certain infections, we definitely need antibiotics. Strep throat caused by uh, Streptococcus pyogenes. We want to take antibiotics for that. That can be a very dangerous infection. But for most infections, our immune system is perfectly fine. So we all have to get smart about antibiotics and only take them if we absolutely need them.